I would have this figured out. Thank you, Michelle. I always, I love this church because you get a variety of types of music and different tastes. And so it's beautiful, Michelle. Thank you for playing that. It's good to see you back. <laughs> Glad to have you. She used to be an organist for many years uh, in the past, so it's good to have her here this morning. Well, welcome. Hi. How's everyone doing this morning? Um, I'm Jeff Rickett, the lead pastor here at Neilsville. We're glad you're here worshiping with us here at Presence in person, and we thank you for those who are joining us online. So good to have you. Just a couple announcements. Tomorrow, I think, is the last day to complete the nomination uh, team form. Is that correct, Sue? So if, uh, if, you have, if you've been praying about a desire to serve in some way and you feel that God has called you to serve as an elder or deacon, or even in your own life, if you're thinking of others uh, that you would like to nominate, use that form. You'll find it in the e-letter that we send out on Fridays. Uh, fill that form out and let, let us know uh, who you might think would best serve in those areas. Also, just again, take advantage of our Sunday school offerings. We have four uh, Sunday schools, three that meet online, one that meets here in, in the back parking lot. So just take advantage of those opportunities, a good way to grow together in our faith together, and so I would encourage you in, in that way. Um, with that in mind, let us now come to worship our Lord as Brian calls us to worship, or as the Lord calls us to worship using Brian. <laughs> Amen. It's a joy to be here and to see so many smiling faces on this beautiful morning. Let's, let's rise and let's join together in the call to worship that's printed in your bulletins. It's a call and response kind of thing, so I'll start and you can answer. But whatever were gains to us, we now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, we consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ our Lord, for whose sake we lose all things. We want to know Christ. We want to know the power of your resurrection and participate in your sufferings as we worship you this morning. We come to worship the resurrected Christ. Amen, Lord, we come to worship you. We come here with joy. We come online, we come in person with joy to worship you. We wanna know your power. We wanna know your resurrection. We wanna know all about your sufferings. And we wanna know you, the resurrected Christ, our Lord. And we wanna praise you and adore you for who you are and for what you've done. We praise you, Lord, for your great glory, and let us sing together the wonderful power of Jesus' name. Amen.
worship being the cornerstone of our faith. Let us worship. Someday we will stand faultless before the throne. Please be seated. And before we get to that faultless before the throne part, we need to confess. We need to confess our sins, and that's always a part of our worship. So let's join together and do that. We'll do that in a corporate prayer of confession followed by silent time. Please join me. Gracious God, we worship our risen Savior, 
but we find ourselves weighed down by many things. We would prefer an easy faith, one that does not require us to identify the many ways that our thoughts, words, and actions have scorned your love and holiness. But faith is never easy. It requires our very souls, our very lives. Forgive us when we choose to remain captive to fear and doubt. Remind us that Jesus gave his very life so that we might draw near to you. Deepen our faith and enable us by Christ's resurrection power to live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again on our behalf. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Our sins are wrong and our sins are many, but there is good news. Let us stand together and receive that good news. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given the grace to grow and courage to continue in our new raised life in Christ. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. We confess our faith as we have in recent weeks, and we'll do it through a song, Christ Our Hope in Life and Death. Beautiful song. Please sing along.
be seated. We have the further opportunity to participate in our worship through our offering. And our offering is what enables us to do so many good things here at Nielsville. Um, yesterday, in kind of a last minute thing, I, I jumped in and substituted in an English as a second language class. Never did it before. What a joy that is. You, you have these students who are just dying to learn English. They're really trying hard. They're, they're working hard. They're pouring themselves into it. And we get to help them do that. We get to help them advance and advance themselves and advance their education, advance their careers. And we get to be part of that. And it's through your gifts to Nielsville that we do that. Of course, you know there's three ways that you can give to Nielsville. You can always mail a check. You can always go to the website and give through the website. Or you can text and you can give through an app on your phone there. And we, so let me pray for a moment as we, as we dedicate our offering. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to participate in the lives and works that you would have us to do here at Nielsville to impact our local community, our church, the world around us, and, and the greater world, Lord. We thank you for that opportunity. We thank you that we have the chance to do that. We pray that the gifts and the tithes that we bring will enable us to further your mission here and to advance your kingdom across the world. We, we have the joy of hearing uh, our offertory majestic praise. Amen.
great things he has done. What a beautiful reminder. I just love the organ and piano kind of talking to one another and feeding off one another. That's pretty cool. Thank you, Jana Lee. Thank you, Michelle, uh, for blessing us. Uh, thank you for those musicians that uh, helped us worship this morning, that are helping us worship. Thank you, AJ, for playing the bass for us, and Ezekiel for playing the drum. Appreciate that. Craig and playing the guitar, and our singers, the Farrells, and Joanne. So thank you all for participating today. Well, we're close to being finished in Acts, and everybody's saying, yay, we can go to another book. But we have two more, two more uh, important uh, chapters that we want to flesh out. And today we finally see that Paul is finally off to Rome, but it won't be easy. And I love when, you know, we try to make our songs and our hymns uh, be consistent with, with the message. And sometimes, though, it's more um, than, than we get. And all the songs that we sing, if you picked up words, you're going you know, to see this in, in my sermon as well. But anchor and storms and our need of Christ. So uh, pay attention as you, as you follow along today. Uh, we know that Paul is going to Rome because in last, last week we learned that Paul appealed to Caesar. And so Paul was ordered by Festus, the governor at that time, to be trans for, transferred to Rome. This approximately five-month journey to Rome began mostly in the fall of 59 or 60 AD. It's given in specific details and with extraordinary exactness, consistent with what others would otherwise known about sea travel in that time and place. Brian is now going to come and just read the first 12 verses. But if you can show the map, you could see that if you, if you left from um, Jerusalem to, to Rome, it would have been a straight shot. But you can see how the, the, that was not a direct route, that we have many different things happen that causes Paul not to get there the way that he thought he was going to get there. So follow along as, as Brian reads the first 12 verses. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And I appreciate your allowing me to work on my humility here. I'm going to pronounce all these place names, and I might even pronounce them right. I don't know. Yeah, you're better than me. <laughs> Either way, this is the word of the Lord. Verse 1, and when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking on a ship of Andromitium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And, and putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coasts of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia, there, the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Nidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salome. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they would reach Phoenix a harbor of Crete facing both southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, again, as we gather around your word uh, this morning, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, change us, convict us, uh, move us, draw us uh, to taste and see how good you are. That, that Father, as we experience life's uh, storms, that we would find our anchor more and more in Christ. So, Lord, do your work today as, as, I, as I share the message. Lord, Holy Spirit, do your work of grace, renewal, uh, strength, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me ask you a question before we delve into this dangerous journey to Rome. 
And it's a very personal question, but how do you handle the storms in your life, in your life that come your way? The brutal waves of serious illness and uncertainty. The powerful winds of difficult and broken relationships. The unexpected shipwreck of dashed dreams. What anchors you? This powerful story of Paul's journey to Rome shows us what anchors him as he faces a violent storm that causes the shipwreck. We will first look at this terrifying and most famous shipwreck in ancient history. Luke provides us with a vivid, detailed account of Paul's journey to Rome. Many consider this his fourth missionary journey. And that as we look in detail of this journey, we'll then have some takeaways of what Paul anchored himself in and, and helps us then figure out how we can anchor ourselves in the very same things that he anchored himself. So let's look at the voyage to Rome. Brian just read uh, verses 1 to 2, and we see that the, Paul's journey begins with being assigned to a Roman centurion named Julius, and he was placed on a ship destined for Italy. Now, being a Roman citizen, Paul was allowed to take along two of his companions, and he did, Luke and Aarakakis, a faithful Christian brother from Thessalonica. We see that Paul then was treated respectfully and honorably by Julius, for when they docked in Sidon, he was permitted to disembark and visit his Christian friends. Now, two takeaways right here. God gave Paul some special gifts. First of all, this is probably the first time in a while that someone over authority of him was gentle and kind and thoughtful to him, for he allowed him to go visit his Christian friends at that dock. But secondly, that he was able to visit his friends. And so I believe that God knew that he needed that encouragement from his Christian brothers and sisters in that small town. That he needed refreshment and reminded of who he is in Christ so that he could handle the storm that was about to come his way. So that's just two little small takeaways from that. That just that act of how God worked in the life of Julius to give him that, to show Paul that kindness. So after leaving Sidon, they, they had to sail up around uh, Cyprus. And rather than straight to Italy in the west, because the winds were contrary. And then they landed in Asia Minor, and Julius transferred Paul and the other prisoners to a large Egyptian grain ship, this freighter. Now, a typical grain freighter was about 140 feet long. So it's about the half the size of, of a football field. It was 36 feet wide and bore... 30 feet drought. It was a sturdy ship, but, it had, but in the high seas, it was really no good at all. The biggest issue of this ship was that it had difficult time sailing into the wind. So as they departed Myra in the freighter, they reached nearby Nidus with significant difficulty. And they were forced to sail under the shelter of Crete so that with further difficulty, they, they reach Crete's small southern port of Fairhavens. Now, in verses 9 and 10, Paul, an experienced travel, right? He, he, he was on ships before. He, he understands what's going on. He warned Julius that they should stay in Fairhavens because it was after Passover. And that's what the mean pa fast mean. He was, that's referring to Passover. And so Passover was about mid-October. And everybody knew that it was dangerous to travel and to make a voyage at that time of the year. It just wasn't usually done. Also, because Fairhaven was also a very boring port, nobody wanted to spend time there. And so um, it was not ideal for wintering. They, they wouldn't have any party life, I guess, in a sense. It wasn't like New York City port, or maybe it's more like, I don't know, a small port you know, on the East Coast. Who knows? I don't know. But it wasn't an exciting place for them to stay. And so they decide uh, to, go, uh, to, to go on the journey. But we see that a wind began to blow. The captain decided to take the chance and set sail for a much nicer port of Phoenix, about 40 miles away. Now, let me read from verses 18 through 20, and we see where this storm comes into play. It's a severe storm, so I'm going to just read the first few verses, to verse 18 through, through um, 20, or 13 through 20. It says, Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their proper purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempest wind caught the northeaster. You know, I never thought 
That, I thought that was a new word. That's, you know, what do I know? <laughs> so it's right here in the Bible. Northeaster is in the Bible. Isn't that cool? Anyway, struck, <laughs> just bear with me today. <laughs> Laugh when I'm not really funny and, you know, whatever. Here you go. They struck down from the land, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were dri- driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called uh, Kitkata, they managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest laid on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. So this northeaster was causing chaos and fear among the crew. They were in the grips of a deadly storm that was driving them west. The danger faced by the 276 crew and passengers worsened rapidly. With great difficulty, they secured the dinghy, and then they proceeded to pass big ropes around the hall and hoist them tight to the tie the ship together. Next, they jettisoned the cargo and cut away the tangled gear that littered the deck. Day after day for 14 days, there was no light by the sun, nor nor stars and moon by night. They splashed in the deep until finally they gave up hope of being saved. Now, two years earlier, in Acts 23, 11, Christ appeared to Paul in his cell and told him to take courage, for he will declare the message of the gospel in Rome. This was an unconditional promise that Christ made to Paul. There was no doubt about it that this was going to happen. But however, even that is true, God has never promised smooth sailing along the way. And a takeaway for us, as we serve Christ, there will be many storms, there will be many hardships, there will be many trials, there will be high seas, there will be brutal waves, there will be breakdowns, but also as, we're, as we grow in Christ, there will be peace, assurance, fruitfulness, and the sustaining presence of God. In fact, this voyage reminds me of Christ walking to his disciples in the stormy sea of Galilee when their ship was about to sink in Matthew 14. They were in danger precisely because they had followed the orders of Jesus. Jesus told them to go out onto the lake, and they obeyed. See, those of us who believe that all who follow Christ will always have smooth sailing or gravely misunderstanding and tragically misrepresenting the word of God. Christ warned his disciples, he warns us that we will face trials, we will experience suffering, but he also assured them that he would be with them and that he would be with us. Listen to what he says as he walks out onto the water to calm the fears of the disciples in Matthew 14, 26 to 27. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid in the midst of the storm. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Now in Acts 27, verses 21 and 22, we hear something similar from Paul. Paul shouted above the spray of the howling storm to the crew and passengers, It says this in verses 21 and 22. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and have not sailed from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet, now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Amid the huge waves attacking the ship. 
as it was moving towards to be shipwrecked onto an island, Paul's soul, soul was as calm as a cucumber and had amazing courage. Why? Why? How could he face the storm, the storm that everybody else was giving up hope that they would be alive? How could he stay calm and courageous during that time? Because he anchored himself in a way that he knew would help him. Friends, every Christian can have courage and calmness in whatever may come our way, whatever storm, whatever brutal waves, whatever winds that may come our way, through illness, through unknown uncertainty of dashed dreams, whatever storms we may face, we can too have courage and calmness amidst the storms if we have the right anchors. So what is the first anchor that we see? Look at verse 23. We see that Paul was anchored in God's presence. And as we are anchored in God's presence, that provides us courage and calmness in life's storms. Listen, what does it say? For this very night stood before me an angel of God. On the deck of a sinking ship in a raging storm, Paul was anchored in God's presence. This is an ongoing reality for him. This was not the first time Paul experienced the assurance of God's presence. In Corneth, Christ came to Paul in a vision and said this, Do not be afraid, Christ says, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. In Acts 23.11, what I referred to earlier, when, when Paul was in his prison cell, it, it says this, The following night the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And then later in Rome, as he is there waiting his next, what's going to happen next, he writes to Timothy, his mentoree, that Christ stood with him. Listen to what he says to Timothy. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be proclaimed and all the Gentiles might, be, might hear it. So, as, so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Hebrews 13, 5, maybe Paul wrote that letter, we're not sure, but it reminds us about God's presence. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Dan Ortland in his book, Gently and Lowly, get this book, it's worth every dime. It's subtitled, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. He encourages us in this way. Listen to this. The same Christ who wept at the tomb of Lazarus reaps with us in our lonely despair. The same one who reached out and touched lepers put his arms around us today when we feel misunderstood and sidelined or even rejected. The Jesus who reached out and cleansed messy sinners reaches into our souls and answers our half-hearted plea for mercy with the mighty, invincible cleansing of one who cannot bear to do otherwise. You see, the same Christ who was really present with Paul during this raging storm is present with us in the storms of life we face. In other words, Christ's heart is not far off despite his presence is in heaven. For he does all this work by his Holy Spirit. Now think about this amazing truth about his presence. Jesus himself, listen, is closer to you today than he was to sinners and sufferers he spoke and touched in his earthly ministry. Let me say that again. Jesus is closer to you today than he was to sinners and sufferers who spoke and touched in his earthly ministries. Again, Ortland says, through his spirit... Christ's own heart envelopes his people with an embrace nearer and tighter than any physical embrace could ever achieve. Think about it. The storm that you're facing this life, whatever that might be for us, that through his spirit, Christ's own heart envelop, envelops you with an embrace nearer and tighter than any physical embrace could ever achieve. Friends, this courage, this reality, God's presence with us in Christ encourages us when life gets scary, 
when life gets difficult, when we face the unknown of our future. But not only is Paul anchored in the presence of God, he's also anchored in the one to knowing who he belongs to. Look at verse 23. It continues. It says, So from this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong. To whom I belong. Paul had courage in the storm because he knew who he belonged to. He saw himself belonging to God. So how do we belong to God? One way we belong to God is as a bride belongs to the bridegroom. The Song of Solomon says this, My beloved is mine, and I am his. The beloved is mine, and I am his. That's a description of those who know Christ, that that Christ sees us as his bride, and he is our bridegroom. In fact, the Bible often uses the intimacies between husband and wife to illustrate our beautiful union with Christ. In Ephesians 5, Paul's description of the marriage relationship he concludes saying this, This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. You see, Christ sees us beautifully. He, it talks about that passage in Ephesians that he, he sanctifies us, he, he cherishes us. See, what, those who belong to Christ know that they belong to Christ. He's our very own bridegroom who will never divorce us, who's always with us. Another way we belong to him in a personal way is like a sheep to a shepherd. Like a sheep to a shepherd. Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. As the Father and Son know each other, now we are able, because we're in Christ, we can know God. We know who we belong to. We are his sheep, stubborn, wayward sheep, and yet God calls us to be part of the flock. And as Jesus knows the Father, we too can know the Father through Christ. A third way that Paul knew that he belonged to him and that we know that we belong to him is like a child belongs to his father. Like a child belongs to his father. It says, because you are sons in Galatians 4, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God, then an heir through God. See, Paul was confident that he belonged to God because he knew that his father was with him, that he could cry out, Abba, Father. Every person who has put their faith in Christ is a child of God, where we have this intimate personal relationship where we can cry out, Abba, Father. And then the fourth way we know we belong to God is because he bought us. He bought us. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, encourages, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. You are bought with with the price. The love paid price was Christ's own death for our sins and for our justification. He gave his life to purchase us for himself. You see, Paul's courage was rooted and anchored in knowing that he belonged to God through Jesus Christ. Anchored in Christ's presence, anchored in belonging to Christ, provided him courage in this raging storm. Being anchored as well in the service of God provided him courage. Look at verse 23 at how it ends. For this very night stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. Paul had courage because he anchored himself in the service of God. His life and ministry were one of declaring the good news to the nations. He knew no harm would come his way unless God allowed it. So with all the trials and sufferings that Paul had experienced, right? He's been beaten. He's been in prison. There's been plots to kill him. He has been hurt. He's, he's now facing this storm and now shipwreck. But he did not, he did not, he did not waver from his service to God 
and gospel ministry. As he rested in God's presence, as he knew that he belonged to God, he had a confidence in his call for his life, and that empowered him to courageously serve others. Listen to what he says to the church in Philippi. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so, it, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. See, Paul was confident in who God has called him to be, to be someone who is called to share the gospel. That's a call for each of us. And as we are confident in that call, that helps us then to be anchored and knowing that he is with us and for us. The question is, anchor yourself, or not the question is, but the reality for us is that we need to anchor ourselves in God's ministry call for your own life. Be confident that God is at work in your service to him. He will grow you, but we also see he also grows others in their faith because of this work, this suffering that Paul experienced, that that had an impact on others that he worked with, and that they, as he was bold in declaring Christ, they too became bold in sharing Christ because they looked to see how Christ worked in the life of Paul. And then they knew that they could be encouraged in their call as well. Anchored in God's presence through Christ. Anchored in belonging to Christ. Anchored in their service to Christ. And lastly, we see we, we are called to anchor ourselves in God's promises, for that too will provide courage in the storms of life. Look at verses 24 and 25. We see that being anchored in God's promises provides courage in life's storms. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. This is Jesus speaking to him. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men. Paul tells everybody else, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run around, must run aground on some island. Paul was encouraging the 275 others on that sheet who had no relationship with God, but he, again, but he told, boldly says to them, God is a God who is faithful to his promises. And because God, I believe that God is faithful to his promises, he will rescue and protect us. Why did God have so much courage and boldness to tell others that in the midst of the raging storm, not to be afraid? Because Paul was 100%, he 100% believed in God's promises. He truly trusted and rested in God's character and promises and as we do as well, that will enable us to be people of courage and calmness and to shout words of encouragement to others above the storms. Listen, in this impossible situation, Paul says, so take heart, men, for I have faith in God. Take heart. Look at me. Look how calm and cool I am. It's not because of anything I am. It's because of the God who has said he will be with us. See, he was anchored to Christ by faith, and that made all the difference for him in the world. He believed God's word. He believed his promises. And as he did, and as the story of this shipwreck unfolds, Paul's courage was empowered by Christ, and others would, was able to see that. You see, after Paul's encouragement, before God saved them from the sinking ship, things became worse. As the darkness continued, their sounding lines revealed that the ship was nearing shore and certain death. In a final effort, the sailors cast off four anchors from the stern, and they held. The men desperately prayed for daybreak, it says. Some of the sailors tried to escape in the ship's dinghy under the pretense of laying more anchors. But Paul warned Julius that unless all the men maintained, remained on the ship, to help navigate the landing, all would be lost. See, the boat was cast away in obedience to Paul and the God he served. Paul then 
And his care for the crew encourages them to eat. And they did. And then their spirits seem to pick up. Listen to how it ends in verses 37 through 44. Here it records their salvation by shipwreck. Verses 37, it says, we, we were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea at the same time, loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered all those who could swim to jump off overboard first and then make for the land, and the rest, of, the rest on planks of the pieces of the ship. And so it was, all were brought safely to land. They were brought safely to land. God saved the day. What a Savior. What a Lord. No one was lost that day. And I can imagine God's name was beautifully glorified and shared. Why are there storms and shipwrecks in our lives today? The God who controls the winds and the waves could have certainly have spared Paul this dire storm. I believe first we need to be reminded that whatever God allows to come our way, he loves us and he will give us a sufficient grace to endure and remain faithful to him as we anchor ourselves to these things. Secondly, storms and shipwrecks of life can also be for our benefit. Yes, Paul was mature in his relationship with Christ, but he was still being shaped through the storms of life. If we're honest, and if I'm honest, we are often objective-oriented. We just want to get to Rome. But God, in his mercy and grace, is process-oriented. Yes, we might want to get to Rome, but God is even more interested in how we get there. So he will use storms of life to mature us and to grow us and to help us to anchor ourselves more and more in his presence, in his power, in his promises, and be belong to him. Storms also can be good for others, we see. Aboard the ship, people learn about each other very quickly. We see panic, we see fear. We see people fending for themselves, but we also see Paul as he was anchored in Christ. We see calmness, gentle and humble leadership, compassion. He cared for them. Even, even though they, everybody was like all a mess, he, well, he still cared that they would eat, right? And wisdom. Paul's courage reflected Christ to the other passengers. Maybe some came to faith in Christ after that shipwreck in the month that fo- months that followed in Malta. I know when Val and I were, when we experienced infertility and the loss, how the, how, the, how the faith of others encouraged us and helped us to grow in Christ. I know that as we matured in, in, in Christ and how our suffering helped others as well mature in Christ. Sometimes suffering is used so that we can be a blessing to others. The question for us Are you in a storm today? Does it look like your ship is about to be wrecked? Dear friends, oh dear friends, anchor yourself in God's presence. Because I can say confidently, Christ is with you. Anchor yourself in belonging to God. Because I can say confidently that you are his and he is yours. Anchor yourself in God's service. I can confidently remind you that your worship of God matters. It's not in vain. And lastly, anchor yourself in God's promises because I can confidently say that God is faithful, absolutely faithful to his word. With these anchors, as a child of God, 
as a sheep of a good shepherd, one who has been purchased by the blood of Christ, you will, yes, we will wrestle, but ultimately you will stand with courage and calmness by the grace and the power of God. Let's pray. Jesus, as we sail through life's storms, may your presence and rule in our lives preserve our trust in you. May we not allow the winds and waves to draw us away from serving you faithfully, wholeheartedly, courageously. When we decide whether to believe circumstances are our sovereign Lord, may we again and again choose to trust in you and your promises and your presence. And may others see you in us and come to know you too through Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, Father, as we lift up those in our congregation that are wrestling with many storms today, we think of Kim Blewett, who's in the hospital, needing your care. Help her to know, anchor her, help her to anchor herself in you. Heal her, strengthen her, give her doctor's wisdom on how best to care for her. We pray for our brother Kevin, who's at Georgetown, still, I think, on a ventilator. Care for him, minister to him, strengthen him, we pray. Be with our family. Be with our dear brother Mario as he wrestles with cancer, and we pray that they would, tumors would continue to shrink. We pray for one who lost a loved one just recently. We pray in these storms of life, Lord, that you remind them of your love, of your presence, of your promises, that they belong to you, that you're with them. Even more, you are with them. Hold them tighter and nearer than they've ever experienced before. Do that work of grace. Pray for those that have, are experiencing broken relationships. Remind them of your love, O oh God. Remind them of your presence, O oh Lord. Father, thank you that, that ye, we can be confident and courageous and calm because of Christ and his work in our lives. Thank you that you forgive us when we're not, when we allow our fears and our circumstances to overtake us. Thank you that you are so committed to drawing us back and reminding us of your nurture and grace. So do that among us, I pray. And Father, thank you for this prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and worship this Jesus who is with us, who is for us, who is faithful to his promises, who helps us in our times of fear. Let us sing boldly.
When darkness seems to hide his face, O oh, rest in his unchanging grace. In high and storming gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good. God is good. Where his grace and goodness known in our Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart, let the fire of my brains, the echo of my days, he is my song. Oh, Christ is good, good, good. Even in the midst of the storms, even in the midst of the trials, even in the midst of hardship, he is good, good, good. Go in that reality. Go in the peace of being known and loved by Christ. Amen. Thank you. 